I'm back looking at the kings of Israel and Judah. We've come a long way. Been doing this for a couple years. Looking at a different king each time we can. We've made it to King Josiah. And King Josiah, one of the better kings, if not the best, son of wicked King Ammon, grandson of wicked king turned good king, King Manasseh, great-grandson of King Hezekiah. So let's look at him. 2 Kings 23, or 2 Kings 22. Yeah, 2 Kings 22. Look down at verse 8. It says, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And I'm just going to call this, When you find the book. Now, they don't find the book till down here in verse 8. But somebody in Josiah's past had got a hold of something God said somewhere and went with it because they've planted it in Josiah's heart because he's already starting out good before he even found the, the book of the law. He's already got some of the word in him. I don't know if he heard it from King Manasseh or where he heard it. You know, King Ammon was around 16 years old when he had... Josiah, and I heard a great preacher the other day, I think it was Michael Caesar, say, well, maybe Josiah turned out good even though Ammon was bad because since Ammon was so young when he had him, maybe Manasseh raised him, and Manasseh brought him up, and he talked about how grandparents mean a lot. Grandparents that are right with God mean a lot and can do a lot to change the spiritual future of their grandkids so possibly king manasseh took josiah under his wing you know after manasseh got right with god who knows but josiah had to have some of the word in him it says in verse one josiah was eight years old when he began to reign just eight years old now remember the verse we use for these young kings, Ecclesiastes 12.1. If you want to turn to Ecclesiastes 12.1, it says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Maybe you're eight years old. I doubt there's an eight-year-old listening to this. Maybe you are eight years old. Maybe you're 15. Maybe you're 16. Remember your creator now. Go ahead and remember him now. You're going to make decisions now that will affect you the rest of your life. So King Josiah here, eight years old when he begins to reign, and Jeremiah preached in the 13th year of Josiah's reign. That's when Jeremiah started preaching, was in the 13th year of Josiah. So to give you an idea of when the book of Jeremiah took place, Jeremiah 1 and verse 2 says, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. So Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned thirty and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, Jedidah, Jedada. I can't hardly say her name. I tried, and I've been listening to Scorby trying to remember it, but now that it's 4 o'clock in the morning, I, I can't remember how to pronounce it. Jedidah, G-D-D-A. Not everybody gets my name right either, so... So his, that was his mother's name, and it means beloved. I think that's significant. I love to look up the, the meaning of names. Her mother's name was beloved. Perhaps she trained Josiah 
and the way he should go. Judging by her name, maybe she's the one that really took him under her wing like a mother should and gave him the word of God. The word of God that she would have had, that she would have had revealed to her. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he, when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, even if he's not listening now, you're putting all those seeds in him right now. Like my grandma at a young age, all through my childhood, I didn't pay much attention to it, but she was constantly putting the word of God in me. And now look, now that's my life. That's what I do every day. You know, I've, I'm a failure. I'm a flop. That's for sure. And I really mean it when I say that. I believe I'm truly a flop. I believe people around me think I'm a flop many times. But when it comes to the Bible, that's my life. And you can find a lot of people that are doing it way better than me. But it's going to be hard to find somebody that loves the Bible as much. I take it with me everywhere I go. I take it to work. When I leave the house, it's with me. My main Bible, my big Bible. It goes every, It goes where I go. And I'm not saying that bragging. I'm just saying my grandmother put the Word of God in me starting at a young age. And even though I didn't pay attention to it until I was 21, all those seeds were there in place, ready to go when I made the free will choice to turn to God and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe she trained up a child in the way he should go. And look at 1 Timothy 5.14. In 1 Timothy 5.14, it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Guide the house. You know, maybe you're a mom and you think you don't have much to live for. Maybe you're having to stay at home. Just realize you do have a lot to live for. Your job is so very important. And most people that grow up and get right with God, they can think back about a godly mother that they had or a godly grandmother that they had that trained them up in the way they should go. Always talking about a Bible story. Always talking about a Bible verse. Always playing a, a, a hymn or something at home that they heard every day. Maybe Jedediah, which means beloved, trained up Josiah in the way he should go and guided the house in a way to where that's what he was hearing was something about the God that made him. In Titus 2, 4, it says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. I think she must have loved Josiah. I don't know for sure. I don't know much about her. But maybe that's what helped Josiah. That's what made, maybe that's what made him get right. It says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 30 and one years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jediah, the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. So the daughter of Adiah of Boscath. Now this guy's name means witness of the Lord. Well, perhaps he witnessed to, jo to Josiah. And maybe that's why he turned out so well. In 2 Timothy 3.15, it says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Every night, unless something goes bad, I'm putting the word of God in my kids. I got a four-year-old, I've got an eight-year-old. And we just went verse by verse through Revelation. We just finished that. Now we're just looking at Jonah. I'm going to do a bigger book and then a small book. And I'm drawing pictures to go along with what was taking place. You can imagine the wild pictures that I got from Revelation. 
and they were just eating it up. And your kids will listen. They'll sit down and listen for the most part. If you can make it interesting for them, they'll listen. And maybe that's what Jedida and Adiah did for Josiah. Maybe they did that for him. His name is Adiah, meaning witness of the Lord. Now, verse 2, it says, And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, first time you see that, you almost want to say automatically, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. No, this time, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's a breath of fresh air. You don't see it much because most of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. But Josiah did right and walked in all the way of David, his father. You see? He's in the line of David. And all the kings are compared to David because David was the standard. He walked in all the way of David, his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. See, they're all compared to David, just like we're compared to a perfect man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't get the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you'll never compare to him. The only reason I get to go to heaven is because God gave me the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when God compares my record to the Lord Jesus Christ's record, it's just like his. That's why I get to spend an eternity with the Lord, you see. So, his father Ammon was evil. Like I said, perhaps his grandfather Manasseh trained him up before he passed and caused him to walk right in the sight of the Lord. You see, grandparents, don't forget it, are important. Really important. In Proverbs 17, 6, Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men. And the glory of children are their fathers. So children's children are the crown of old men. The grandchildren. Are you, do you see your grandchildren as a crown? Train them up in the way they should go. You know, Josiah knew the way to go. And he didn't stray to the right or to the left. He's staying on that narrow way. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah. The 18th year. So if he was 8 when he started to reign, this would, he'd be about 26 then in the 18th year of his reign. That the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, Meshulam the scribe, to the house of the Lord saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. So, he's celebrating his 18th birthday doing something for the Lord. Or not 18th birthday, but 18th year of his reign, doing something for the Lord here. Only 26 years old, remembering his creator, in the day of his youth. You see, you need to number your days now. Number your days. He's only 20, around 26 years old. And look what he's doing. He's thinking about God. How many 26-year-olds do you know that are thinking about God? How many 30-something-year-olds do you know that are thinking about God? You see, they're not thinking about God because they've not lived long enough to reap the consequences of the sins they've been doing all this time. You know, when you get up 40, 50, 60, you're reaping all that junk you did, living like the devil himself for years, and now you're reaping it all. Right now, you're sowing all this wickedness, and you're going to reap it later. And you're not realizing you don't have that much time. I mean, think about it like this. Say you're... 25. Think back just 10 years ago to when you were 15. It really doesn't seem that long ago. 10 more years, you do that one more time, 10 more years, you'll be 35. You do it two more times, you'll be 45. 
And each 10 years is going to go by faster. Now, 45 seems old to you right now. And then you do it a third time, that 10 years a third time, you'll be 55. A fourth time, you'll be 65. You'll be knocking on death's door at 65. If the average person lives to be 70, um, you don't really have that much time. You need to number your days. You need to start doing right with God now. And I think when you find the book, and you really find the book, you will begin to live for the Lord and realize that time is on your side if you're living for the Lord, but it's not on your side if you're not living for the Lord. In Psalm 90 and verse 12, it says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. If you're living for the Lord, time seems to go by very fast, but you're using your time wisely. I remember before I was saved, I got saved when I was 21. And when I was 21, I was so overwhelmed and overcome with sin that I felt like I was 50. And I feel younger now in my 30s than I did when I was 21. I felt so old. I felt like I was just a failure. I was an old loser that was going nowhere. But now God's turned my life around. He's taught me to number my days. Each day is important. You know, this is a day you're not going to get back. You'll never be, if you're 26, like Josiah is here, you're never going to be 26 again. Each second is like a little grain in the hourglass and you need to be using that grain of sand wisely so he he celebrates his 18th the 18th year of his reign by doing something for the lord if you live to be 70 you know how many days are left for you think about it i was thinking about this the other day um, if you are, say you're 35, you, 35, maybe you got 35 more years left and you'll be 70, right? So you, 35 times 365, you just got 12,775 days left. Now, in a way, that sounds like a long time, but if you've only got that many days left, that's not that, that doesn't seem like that many. Just 12,775? All right, maybe you're 50. If you're 50 and you live to be 70, and you may not even live to be that old, then you've got about... 7,300 days left, and that's it. I mean, if you're 60, then you have 3,650 days left, if you live to be 70. Now, you may live to be but more than 70, but you need to number your days. You know, you don't have that much time left. I don't have that much time left. Every day, we need to be doing something for God. You know, the Bible says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I view every day alike. Now, some people, they view Sunday as the day. Like, that's the day of the week on Sunday. You don't mow, you don't do nothing. Now, me, and that's fine if they view it that way. Now, me, I view every day the same. And I don't try to be extra spiritual on Sunday I don't try to go all out on Sunday. I'm in the Word of God, loving the Word of God every day. Now, I honestly, I end up reading the Bible less on Sunday because I'm just on the go, not really getting time to just sit and meditate in the Bible. I'd say the weekend's my worst days because, you know, on through the week, you know, you're, I'm getting up early already, and then 
I, I'm going to work, and at work I get more time to to listen to preaching. I listen to preaching all day long, listen to studies all day long. When I'm in the break room, I got my Bible out preparing these lessons. It's like on Saturday and Sunday, you're you're spending more time with your family. You got church. You know, every day is special. You need to number your days. Every day is special. It's not just about Sunday. People get that in their mind because they're calling Sunday the Lord's Day. And they think, well, today's the day I'm going to sit by for God. And they think that they're super spiritual for, for going to church on Sunday and Wednesday night. But it needs to be every day. You are the house of the Lord. You're always in church in that sense. You're always in the body of Christ. You know, God's with you everywhere you go. You don't enter the presence of the Lord in a building. You need to get that out of your mind. If you get that out of your mind, you'll realize that you are an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ every day. And you need to number your days. So, it says in verse 4, or verse 3, it says, And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord. So count the money that's brought in, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. So the money that they've gathered of the people, they're going to count it and let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord and let them give it to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair, repair the breaches of the house unto carpenters and builders and masons and to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. So, He's thinking about the house of the Lord. He's wanting them to take this silver that they've counted up and use that to buy material to repair the house of the Lord. So you need, when you find the book, I believe you'll, you'll start building. I believe that when you really get into the book, you're going to build these foundations, this wall of scripture, this wall of Bible doctrine all around you, a safety net. And you can compare that to what he's doing here. You need to get your temple repaired. Your body, like I said, is the, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And remember, Jesus is a carpenter. Remember, he, when he walked here on the, in the flesh, he was a carpenter, Mark 6, 3. Paul is called a wise master builder in 1 Corinthians 3, 10. You know, I got a friend, Art Martin. He's old now. He's he's like 90 now. But you've probably heard him on here. He was a brick mason and a pastor. So he laid a foundation for people in both in his secular job and in his spiritual job. His All through his life, he was laying a foundation. Building... You know, a wall of scripture around himself, around the people. And you know, you you got pastor, you got men that God gave to the body of Christ as a gift. Some pastors, some evangelists and teachers for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Those are your carpenters and your builders and your masons. And they're trying to build you up. Ecclesiastes 12, 11 says, The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. So the, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails. The word of God's like nails. In Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, Is not my word like a hammer? So the word of God's like a hammer and nails, and you're using it to build. You're building a foundation. You're building a wall around you. And 
Look what it says here. He says in verse 7, Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. He didn't have to go back and make sure that that they were doing right with the money. They were dealing faithfully. You know, that reminds me of Romans 12, 17, where it says, Rank of pence no man, evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. Josiah believed they were providing things honest in the sight of all men. And then it says in verse 8, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So they found the book. They found the book of the law, and they're reading it first thing. So he found it, and then he gives it to this other guy to read it. Think about that. Have you helped someone find the book after you found it? Maybe you found the book. In the sense that the Bible means something to you now. Before you may have had several Bibles in your house. But you hadn't found them because they meant nothing to you. You had heard the word of God. Bible stories your whole life. But you never found the book because it meant nothing to you. When it means something to you. You're going to read it every day. It's going to affect your life. You're going to do something with it. And you're going to try to f help somebody else find the book. That's one of my main burdens is getting people interested in the Bible. That's the purpose of putting all these lessons out on here. I don't get any money for it. I don't get any credit for it. Nobody knows who I am. Most people just criticize me. But somebody, there's people out there too that send me emails basically saying, I found the book. And if you are constantly in the Word of God, God's going to reveal to you things, and that's just going to make it easier and easier for you to help somebody else find the book. Now you think about this. They're, they're in the house of the Lord, and that's where they found the book. Now if we're the house of the Lord today, and somebody looked in you, would they find the book in you? Do you have the word of God hid in your heart? Is there in you the house of the Lord today? Is the word of God hid in there somewhere that's going to come out and help somebody else find the book? It says in verse 9, And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was, in, that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work, that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now they're trying to help the king find the book. Have you ever delivered someone the book? Or got them interested in it. Or told them, you really need to read it. It's so much better than you think it is. It's so much more than just black words on white paper. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. So when you find the book, you don't just need to read it. You need to hear it. You see, here they are reading the book to the king, and he's hearing it. You know, you hear a lot of people say, and I even used to think this, that, yeah, you can listen to the word, but it's not like reading it. But I think you need to do both, and I think that maybe if you don't, it, there's a lot of people that don't have time to sit down and read it. Maybe their their life's so hectic, and they don't have as much time. I, I, you know, there's people that says, you know, you you have to make time. You gotta, yeah. But they're not in that person's shoes to make that call. I get tired of hearing people saying, "Well, you gotta you gotta do this and you gotta do that." But they're not in that person's shoes, are they? Maybe you don't have time to. 
Maybe your life is just so busy on the go. I don't know your schedule to where you can't get much reading done. But maybe you can get some headphones and get an audio Bible. Maybe Alexander Scorby. Maybe something like that. That's what I like. Or make your own even. And just listen to that word of God every day. On the way to work. On the way from work. Maybe on break. Maybe they allow you to listen to headphones while you're working. And you can get so much of the word of God in you. And he's hearing the word read to him. And he gets even more under conviction. Wanting to do more and more for God after he hears it. So I believe you need to read it and hear it. And I believe if you can't read it, then God will really bless you listening to it, hearing it. And verse 12 says, And the king commanded Hilkiah, his priest, and Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, and Akbor, the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Asahiah, a servant of the king's, saying, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that is written concerning us. So the book, the book of the law that he's found has made him realize that the previous kings, for the most part, weren't doing right. And that stuff like that, elim the Bible eliminates the idea that just because you're older means you're always right. You know, Josiah had a, a lot of people that came before him. You know, he had a lot of kings before him. A lot of his fathers didn't do right. Most of them didn't do right. And, you know, there's a lot of older people today they think that they're always right because they're older. They think that uh, people now are just way worse than automatically just way worse because we're later on in the history of man and because e evil men seducers wax worse and worse. That's true, but that doesn't automatically mean you're more right because you're older or that the people from days gone by are automatically more right than the younger people coming up now because the book of the law has made him discover that they weren't doing everything right. And there's a lot of times that I'm looking at the Bible and what older people are telling me to do and what I've seen older Christians do or heard about them doing wasn't right just because they're older. You know, the Lord's looking for someone who will tremble at his word. Like Josiah's doing here. He's he's renting his clothes. In verse 11, he rent his clothes. That's like the Hebrew thing, the Hebrew custom that, that indicates they're in deep sorrow. And Josiah's hearing it. He's hearing the word. And he's getting really troubled by it. Because he knows they're doing wrong. They're reading about those blessings and those cursings back there about what what happens when you don't go by the book and it says in verse 14 so Hilkiah the priest and Ahiakim and Akbor and Shaphan and Asahiah went unto Huldah the prophetess the wife of Shalem so they're going to Huldah he told them go inquire the Lord so you see this this, uh, you, if you, when you rightly divide the word of truth, he had to go. He had to inquire of the Lord, and go get a prophet to talk to to talk to the Lord and come back with a word. Me and you got something greater going on. We got all the word of God that God's going to give us, and we can go directly into the throne room. I can read the word of God. And talk to God at the same time. I can talk to the author. When you find the book. It will cause you to talk to the author. Because you will realize the same God that wrote this. Is the same God you can talk to. And like if you don't understand a verse. Read the verse and say help me understand that. 
You read the next verse and say, I understand that. That's really good. You read the next verse and say, I can't believe that, that God did that. You read the next verse and say, God, please help me not to do that. You see, you can talk to the author as you read it. And so they go to this prophetess. This is a, a woman prophet. And just like, you know, Isaiah, he had a wife that was a prophet. Miriam, I believe, is called a prophet. You got around seven prophetesses in the Bible. Some of them are bad, like Jez Jezebel, obviously, calleth herself a prophetess. She's bad. And you, you got some bad, you got like two bad ones. You got like five good ones. And a lot of people that use this to say, well, you know, Joyce Meyer, Paula White are just fine. But no, that's something completely different. Just because Huldah is a prophetess doesn't mean she's got all this authority over men and things like that. You know, when a woman is like a pastor and she, she's got authority over men, that puts things backwards. That's not in order. You know, the man's supposed to be the spiritual leader of the home. How is he the spiritual the leader of the home when his wife is his overseer, his spiritual leader as his pastor? That makes no sense. And you say, well, well, maybe her husband doesn't go there. Well, then she's spiritual leader of all kinds of other husbands and men. You see how backwards that is? So uh, just because a woman is a prophetess doesn't mean she's got authority over men. She's just telling them what God said. And, you know, you as a woman, as a Christian, if you're listening to this, you can tell people what God said out of the book. You can say, I know I'm going to heaven in the future. Because I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're prophesying when you do that. And that's not having authority over men. That's just being a witness. And in that, in the sense of doing that, we're all called to preach. Even like, you know, when a woman goes and tells somebody out how to be saved, that's preaching the gospel. That's not having authority over men. That's not what Paul's teaching against in Timothy and Corinthians when he says let the women keep silence in the churches and where he says I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man that's what that's referring to a woman being like a pastor or being a preaching and like having an authority over other Christian men in a service you see it's not saying you know she can't tell somebody how to be saved it's not saying she can't teach the women or the children. You know, in Titus, it talks about how they need to teach the younger women. They need to guide the house. They're teaching their children. But this in no way makes Joyce Meyer and Paula White not rebellious because they're very rebellious and they're not Bible believers, and they're not giving you what thus saith the Lord. But that's what Huldah's doing here. And when you find the book, you'll listen to the truth. And you won't. When you find somebody giving the truth, you're going to listen. So this Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikba, the son of Harhas. Keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college. And that's not like a college like you go to now. The college is like the outskirts of the city. And they communed with her. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me. Now she, look, she said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. So remember, it's God's word that you want. You want, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place. Notice this Hulda is given a negative message. It's a very negative message. And most of the Bible is a negative message. 
uh, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book. How many of these women preachers do you see today are given thus saith the Lord and given you all the words of the book? All these phony, rebellious women preachers today change the book to where it will fit them being a pastor or make it look like they're not rebels. It says, Even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. You see, Israel's burned incense to other gods. Israel's forsaken the Lord. You know, the, every king seems like has made it worse and worse with like Josiah and Hezekiah as some exceptions. But they've provoked him to anger with the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. You know, well, you think, well, why did they do weird stuff like burning incense unto gods? Well, there have been times when you've burned in your lust toward another god. But the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire the Lord, thus shall you say to him. So this hold of the, hold of the prophetess is saying, you know, Judah's in rough shape, but go, the Lord wants you to go tell King Josiah, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender. You see, you need a tender heart when it comes to the word of God. People drive me crazy when they do not have a tender heart when it comes to the word and they want to change it. When it bugs them, when it bothers them, when it scares them, they want to change it. They want to make it to match what they want it to say. And thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord. When you're trying to change the word and you won't just accept the word, that does not show a humble heart. He humbled himself before the Lord. He's not a mighty man before the Lord, you know, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. He humbled himself before the Lord. When thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Josiah trembled at his word. He had humbled himself. He had rent his clothes. He wept before him. And it says, Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thy eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. So, he's given Josiah some comfort here. You see, he got a wake-up call and a warning from the word of God, but then he turned around and got comfort and hope from the word of God. And that's what we've got. We've got warnings and we've got God telling us to watch out in the word of God. We've got all this negative message. And then God turns around and says, Thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. So you see, it's sweet and bitter. And it's got warnings, but it's also got promises that will give you hope. Just like, Titus said, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Have you found the book? This is Have You Found the Book, part one. I think I'm going to do part two. We're not even close to being done with King Josiah. And he doesn't just slack off after he finds the book. He amps it up. So we'll see more of that later.